Hi, I'm Tracy Coleman and I've been marked. Um, I'll talk about when I actually experienced the miracle back in 2006. Um, I had unbearable stomach pain and um, we couldn't figure out what was wrong. It um, was going on for a few months um, and the doctors couldn't figure out what it was. It landed me in the ER um, and they just couldn't put their finger on it. They guessed so many different things, gave me medications, but nothing worked. And I remember one Sunday night coming home from church and like wrapped in pain in the bed and buckled over. And my mom came in and she gave me a hot water bottle just to see if it would alleviate some of the pain. And it didn't, but all I remember is saying, um, just like the one with the issue of blood, if I could just touch the hem of your garment, Jesus, I know this pain will go away. And literally, the pain has gone away and it's now 15 years later and I've never experienced that pain again. I would say all powerful. Because he's all powerful, there's nothing impossible for him to do. So if you just believe that he can do it, the word even says it, like if you believe, it can be so. Trusting in the omnipotence of God while waiting for your miracle can be hard. Um, but honestly, it is well worth it. Um, again, from my own experience, if I didn't call out to him and believe that he could do it for me, I would have never probably experienced my miracle. So I just encourage you to believe God for the greater. He cannot fail. What's up? Happy Thursday. Uh, happy Bible study day. Feliz Navidad. Whatever you want to insert your own greeting, insert that right there. Um, it is Thursday and it is Bible study night and we are excited to get into the word of God. I got Minister Adrian. Oh, Pastor Adrian. My bad. I got <laughs> Elder Janae um, with me. And um, but we're excited to do what we got to do. And so you do what you got to do. We want you to hit that share button right now. Um, let everybody know that we are on prayerfully. Somebody will join you today. Um, if you got to text it out, text it out. Sometimes sharing won't work, but we need to make sure that we are spreading um, this gospel to everyone who wants to hear and everybody who doesn't want to hear. And so um, if you did not catch us last week, the benefit of being on YouTube is that you get or oh no, we're on Facebook, that you get to go back um, and look at the past videos. And so. We encourage you, go back, look at the old videos, because we kicked off this series on uh, Mark. It's on the book of Mark. We're dealing with the miracles of Jesus, and this is week two. Um, and as I talked about last week, I won't belabor it, but we are believing God that as we are learning and studying and intentionally focusing um, on the miracles of Jesus, we believe that miracles are hitting our homes, our churches, our cities, our communities. We believe God... Um, um, because he said that miracles, signs, and wonders follow them that believe. Go back last week. You'll hear more about that. Um, and so I'm ready. Let's jump straight in um, to the word of God. Today we're going to be in Mark the fifth chapter. We're in Mark the fifth chapter. Oh, excuse me. The fourth chapter. And we're going to be doing verses 35 through 41. That's Mark the fourth chapter, verses 35 through 41. And so the scripture says this. It says, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side and leaving the crowd. They took him with them in the boat just as he was and other boats were with him and a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and sea to the, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? All right. And that is what we will be dealing with for the remainder of our time together tonight. So um, I want to recap this just small section of last week. And I forewarned you um, that we would be using um, some parts of last week and using that to build off of um, what we are doing um, this week. And so um, we talked about the fact that there are, are different types of miracles, um, including nature miracles, healing, mi healing mir miracles, 
um, et cetera. And this story in particular, this narrative in particular, it is an, um, an example of a nature miracle. And so sometimes we're really focused on what happens to the body, but there are some things that we need that go beyond the body. And so this is a nature miracle, right? And throughout this scripture, we see the three dimensions that we talked about last week, the three dimensions of miracles, we see them unfold in this narrative, right? And so I want to remind you of those three dimensions of, of miracles. We talked about the dynamis or dunamis, depending on how you want to say it, um, which is the displayed power of God. We talked about the terrace, which is the awe of the onlookers. And then we talked about uh, Simeon, which is the drawing of unbelievers. And in this one passage, we begin to see all of that um, worked out in this particular text. So let's get into the text, right? And so um, we see something that I feel like is really important for our day, for our generation, because I believe that this, um, there's some level of debate surrounding this, right? Um, we see um, what I'm going to describe as we see a mega church. Um, we see mega straight from, um, from the beginning of this text. Now, let me help you see where I'm coming from. So prior to these verses, we find that Jesus, um, he spends all day with a large crowd and his disciples, and they're, they are um, teaching about the process of establishing the kingdom of God on earth, right? And he uses um, parables in order to do that. If you were with us last um, session, then you know that we just finished dealing with the parables. And so we know that the parables were used to, um, as earthly representations to describe a heavenly message, right? And so in this, he uses the parable of the sower, he uses um, the parable of the lamp under a basket, um, the mustard seed, he goes through these um, in order to really explain the impact of evangelism. Right. He's going through all of this to really explain the impact of evangelism and the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is readying them um, for what it is that they and we are to do, which is to spread the gospel. Right. And so um, there's these crazy crowds that form when Jesus is present. There are ridiculous crowds um, that are formed when Jesus is present. We often talk about um, how Jesus fed the multitude, right? The 5,000 uh, 5, and the 4,000, um, and we'll get into that as well. Um, but I think that we, we miss that really, like, Jesus was a mega church pastor, right? Like, this is who he was. He was really a mega church evangelist, right? They were, they were um, but they weren't just mega crowds for the sake of having mega crowds, Right. They were mega crowds that also had mega impact. And I believe that um, there's nothing wrong with having um, a mega crowd. There's nothing wrong with having a mega church. But our desire, our hope has to be don't let us just be big for the sake of being big. Um, but let us have the same level of impact as the size of our congregation, as the size of our people, as the size of our community. Let it all match. Right. We don't want just numbers, but we want actual impact right so jesus was a mega church uh, evangelist right and so yeah. um let's talk about that real quick because there there is debate as to whether or not mega is actually should be a thing in the kingdom yeah i is there really any room for debate i mean the kingdom I mean, is people big it. yeah I, know. <laughs> but I mean like the kingdom is is big and it, it's it's supposed to be big right it's big with intention um, but there are two things that I that I think about when I when this comes up. Um, I think what the first thing that stands out to me is everything that's not big is healthy. And so just as you said, um, we have to make sure that, you know, we're not just big for the sake of being mm -hmm. big. I think the health of the organism is important as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so checking that you're not just like swelling and increasing, um, but making sure that the systems that are in place are impactful. Um, and you can you can measure that impactfulness. And in, I'm not, every area is not going to be the same level, right? Mm -hmm. There's always things that are increasing in, in some things that need help. Um, but in a general sense, I think that the overall health um, of any large thing, particularly though the body of Christ in the church, um, is something that should be looked at. Um, and also, I think it's so interesting that no matter what Jesus talked about, he always had a crowd. <laughs> like, even when he was saying like to the point where they like, like tried to push him off of a cliff because they didn't like what he was saying. <laughs> like that was like he he always had large 
crowds. He never changed the message. Yeah. He never diluted anything. Um, and that's a message to us that we don't have to change the message. Yeah. Like the crowd will come, even if they disagree. The crowd will come, um, and the people that need to hear will be there. Um, and so you can be impactful, have the right message, and not water that down just for a crowd, um, because the message is the message that's going to draw. Yeah, mm -hmm. good stuff. Yeah, yeah I think we, uh, we get a little overwhelmed by the numbers, especially if it's something that you're not used to. If you used to only having two neighbors, <laughs> and you don't realize that you have the opportunity to have 2,000, and it could still be successful, effective, and impactful. It just looks different, yeah. you know? Um, and I think the numbers challenge people. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, anything that's too overwhelming or swelling or something like that, it just challenges people. But what drew them to him was he had the answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you have the answer, yeah. you should expect a crowd. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, I think... A lot of times we get intimidated by the the idea of the mega because we don't have confidence in our answer. Mm -hmm. um, but when you have confidence in your answer, you, there, there's just you understand that it will it will draw. And he yeah. um, understood the needs of the crowds and the community that he was going to. But then he also brought the solution. And I think mm -hmm. that we've come to a place where we are fantastic at talking about the needs, <laughs> complaining mm. about how the needs are not yeah. being met. Yeah. And when someone rises up and starts to give an answer, there's a level of frustration. If we're honest, why didn't I think of that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then there comes Christ. And if you have um, a confidence in, in who you are and who he is, that there's, we should be unashamed of the gospel and unashamed of its impact and um, understanding that there's a beauty in the two as well as in the 2000s. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. All right. So let the crowds come. So um, let's start at verse 35. Let's um, let me read that again for you. It says on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. Let us go across to the other side. This is the cross over. This is the crossover. Right. And so um, even with um, all of, of the time and the energy that Jesus had just spent, right, um, with all of these people, with this large crowd, um, he wasn't afraid to just keep it moving, right? Mm -hmm. like, like, I've done my job here, yeah. right? And now it's time for me to transition mm -hmm. to something else because there is more, right? Mm -hmm. And um, wherever you are in, in the comment section, I actually just want you to just type that out. Just type out, there is more. And um, the reason why I want you to type that out is because sometimes we can actually get stuck in that crowd, right? Mm -hmm. that, that the crowd came for a good reason, but we got lost in it because we got lost in the success of it. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I, I think that we need to um, be as careful with success as we are with failure. Yeah. I think we're really cautious about failure. We're intentional about making sure we never get in this position again. But success comes with a, a bit of caution as well because if you're not careful, you will glory in the success and you'll yeah. miss the fact that God is moving me mm -hmm. to something mm -hmm. else, right? And so I want to really just encourage us to move on when God says move, right? Um, that there is something else that he wants to do and you can't really get caught up in in the crowd right and so um his his, his instructions um to these disciples um it indicated that he had a next step in mind right that it didn't terminate with the crowd but there was something else that he wanted um to do and i want to read this um verse and i'm gonna, I'm gonna let the ladies jump in but um matthew the 24th chapter verse 14 says this it says and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come, right? That um, when it's all said and done, that as much um, traction that, might be have, that we might have in our own sphere of influence, um, there, is still, there are still people that are unreached, that um, we have not um, gotten this gospel message to, and if we are not careful, we'll get comfortable preaching to the people who already have received the message yeah. um, and leave out the people who actually need it the most, right? Because the crowd might not actually need that message anymore. Mm -hmm. It actually might be the people who are um, smaller in number. And mm -hmm. I now need to leave the crowd in order to attend to something that is a greater need over here, right? And so um, our, our job of spreading this gospel, right, is a part of our love for, for God, right? Like yeah. it, it is in um, 
our connection to him that we get our marching orders, that we get yeah. the instruction to leave from the thing that you are comfortable in and to really grab hold to the thing that actually might make you uncomfortable and might not seem as profitable, mm -hmm. right? And you can translate that word however you want to translate it. Um, it might not be the more profitable thing, but it is the purposeful thing. And so I think that we need to do purpose over profit. You know, you're just all in my business, but not for <laughs> real. Anyways, <laughs> anyways, so I, as you were, as you were saying that, I just started to think about just something. But um, I feel like I've seen a lot of people on either end of the spectrum, like either they are charging ahead to the next thing, not really with too many marching orders, or are like completely crippled with fear. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think those who have in the past have have moved prematurely, maybe in a space now of being crippled with fear. Um, but I, I think the Lord is showing us, you know, through this, that when you have your ear to his mouth, you, the next time you can do it right. Yeah. Right. Like the mm -hmm. next time, this time you can have the right marching order. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it won't end up like before, because this time you are attentive to the right time, the right, the right time, the right season. Um, and what God would have you to do. Um, and so, and I think for the people on the, on the other end of the spectrum that are like so ready to get to the next thing, um, Jesus and the disciples, they were finished with the crowd before they went to the other side. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so good. the task was completed. Um, and so before That's rushing so off good. to the, to the next thing and hurrying to whatever is over there, yeah. make sure this is completed. Check your work. Check your work. Yeah. Check yeah. your work yeah. and, and make sure that you have, you know, now that you can't always measure that by the people and right. what they want, Correct. because people will tell you, wait, come on, stay a little longer. Yeah. We having fun over here. Right. Um, and that's not always the barometer because people can tend to atta right. be attached to you. Um, and that's not always a bad thing, right? Like when people are drawn to you, they're drawn mm -hmm. to you. Um, but that's why it's important to be so connected to God. Like you said, that when he gives you those marching orders, you know when to, when to depart. Yeah. And if, if I could just add this as well, I think that, um, cause I want to make this clear. Um, that this is not a um, justification for instability, mm -hmm. yeah. right? To just run all over the place, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, because there has to be a space that you are refilled, that you are replenished, that you are poured into so that you can go out and yeah. do the things that God has commissioned you to do. And sometimes we're skipping mm -hmm. one of those steps, mm -hmm. right? So it's like we just continue to get poured into and we never move yeah. or we're on the other uh, um, extreme where we're just moving and moving and moving and moving and you really have nothing to actually ground you and to be rooted in. Yeah. 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 I, this is crazy because I've talked to both of you on the side mm -hmm. and I'm having like light bulbs of little chips and crumbs of mm -hmm. our conversations um, in this moment. And I'm like, how did I miss this before? <laughs> um, because one, I think that this actually shows um, Jesus's incredible ability to have phenomenal time management. Yeah. yeah. The fact, fact that he reached all of these people and then he's like, all right, guys, me. Yeah. On to the next. <laughs> yeah. and still was able to say, I, I know that I, I finished what I needed yes. to do here yeah. so that I can go on to the next. Yeah. Other thing with you mentioning the, the whole concept of success in this scripture in Matthew, I think for us as believers, um, and just just anyone out there, it's super important for you to reflect on, does your definition of success match the mission that you've committed to? Good. Or that you said that you committed to? Yeah. Because um, I think here we see that Christ had a clear understanding of what success looked like and how it was not limited to that crowd because he knew that the mission was to reach all nations. Yeah, so I have so to get good. a head start on all of this and give a template for, for every, all the, the disciples that are following me that this is the mission. Success so is mission specific. It's your yeah. success has to match that. Yeah. And um, I don't think, I think sometimes we run without assessing what, our, what we look at as success. 
Yeah. We, we don't do that. And we definitely, as a result of that, we don't have conversations with the people that we're supposed to be running with mm -hmm. about what our definition of success is. That's good and too. do our definitions align with each yeah. other? And more importantly, do they come back to the mission? Um, and I think he, he has this beautiful way of demonstrating um, how that unfolds and how that unravels and how it's possible to achieve those, merge those two worlds. Yeah. yeah. Can I say something yeah, no, about yeah. that? I think it's so interesting that you said that because most people would look at the crowd and say, good job, Jesus. Like, <laughs> that's success. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we look at that for ourselves and people may like look at us and be like, like what? Did you see what you just did there? Yeah. But God can be saying there is more. Yeah. Um, and so like you said, like matching the mission is so important because even the celebration of other people can mm -hmm. make us feel like we've we've reached the the pinnacle we've reached mm -hmm. the place sure. where god wants us sure. to be um but if you're not in his face you won't know that there's more yeah go yeah. burst <laughs> okay so here's here's the thing there's, there's another i'm just like oh another conversation um jesus was so unwilling to have was so willing to have multiple fresh starts he was willing to start over. Yeah. He was not so caught up in the crowd, in what he was successful in. He didn't get comfortable in that success. And he did not worry about how am I going to start over? What will this look like on the other side of this? Yeah. Because he knew the mission. Yeah. And because he knew the mission and he was confident in his role with making sure that that was executed well, he was able to pivot without being fearful. He was able to pivot and have people follow him and still trust in, in his um, trust in his method, even if they didn't even fully understand what it was or what it looked like. So I really think that um, we can get, and we've talked about this, we can get so caught up in that first fresh start that we don't move and mm -hmm. we don't even want another one. Yeah. But yeah. he understood the, that it was so important to pivot and to not just get stuck at that point. Yeah. Um, so it, it's just amazing to me that he gave other people a fresh start, but he knew that his, his new one was awaiting on the other side. I yeah. think we're provoking each other tonight. So because, I, because I'm also thinking about like we, we focused on Jesus, but I think what we miss, which is as great of a lesson, is the disciples. You get out of my head. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Be, insane. Because while you're saying that Jesus is having multiple fresh starts, it forces them to also have to have multiple fresh starts. They don't get to choose wow. because if you are going to follow him, then you are required to go where he goes, which means that you can't get comfortable either. You've got to also be able to shift and to pivot as he yeah. shifts and pivots. And I think that sometimes that's what happens is that we sign up to be disciples, but we don't necessarily sign up for the pivot. We don't sign mm. up for the, the perpetual stuff, fresh start. We, yeah. we sign up for that first fresh start. I didn't sign up for what came after that, but a life with Jesus is a life of, of pivoting. It's a life yeah. of changing it's a life a life of shifting yeah, yeah. can i just say one go, more thing go, go, so go. with that and that's so good but it, it lends into the point that i was thinking about about the disciples like jesus did those perpetual fresh starts with a shaky team like the oh! disciples were like not always on their a game cut the camera i'm gonna I'm lay out and, and jesus knew this he knew it but he still said yo let's go he never and that's the leader he never slowed down for them and he moment. also never counted them out I like he moment. knew like this is the pace this is the pace i'm setting and it was their job to eventually right because when the, it didn't happen right away but eventually they caught the stride um and and of course we see after that the the people that they turned into um but jesus knew that in the moment and he still took him with them um and so i think that's a lesson to not just the leaders but those under leaders the shaky ones uh, <laughs> those of us who are shaking our boots all the time um the leader sees what you can be yeah and he knows that you're scared but he's still saying let's, let's go because i know side. what you're going to be on the other side of let's this. go i feel hype <laughs> Let's go. Let's go to it. All right. Let's go. All right. Let's go. Okay. Let's go to the next point. So, oh my gosh. All right. Verse 36. So verse 36 says, and leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him and leaving the crowd. They took him with them in the boat, just as he was. 
and other boats were with him. And um, we just want to talk about, in this point, we just want to talk about being positioned for next, right? And um, like, I'm like about to skip all these notes, right? Because I know that, I know that everybody wants next. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants next. Everybody's claiming next, especially in a new year. I got next. But every, not everybody's actually positioned for the next, mm-hmm. right? Because your next might not be where you think that it is, right? Yeah. Your, your next might not come in the package mm-hmm. that you thought it was going to come in. It might not come in the form that you thought it was going to come in. And so sometimes we are forfeiting the next mm-hmm. for the current position that we occupy, mm-hmm. right? Like I'm, I, because you can't have both. Yeah. You can't have what's next and the space that you occupy right now. Mm-hmm. You have to let go of one in order to get the next. Yeah. And so throughout Jesus's ministry, like we, we, he, he taught, right? He taught um, um, by the sea often, right? Like Jesus and water, that's a whole nother conversation. We could have a whole class just on water. Um, uh, but Jesus often found himself by, by the shore and he instructed his disciples to, to get a boat that was, um, to get a boat ready so that the crowd would not crush him, right? Like this was like a necessity, right? So the crowd wouldn't crush him. And in this scenario, Jesus was already teaching in the boat. So Jesus was already teaching in the boat this go round. Um, and, um, while he was in the boat, right? Um, wait, I'm, I lost my spot. I actually lost my whole section in where I was going. Sorry. Um, oh, my bad. All right, so so right, so Jesus is teaching, right? But he's teaching from the boat, right? And he's about to go to the other side, right? And in doing so, he is also showing us, right, like how to be prepared for the next, right? Like while he was with the crowd, yeah, he's already prepared and yeah, in yeah, position yeah. for where he's about to go, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's that whole thing, right? Like when you when you um, when you stay ready, you don't have to get ready, yeah. right? And so Jesus had that mentality: is like I while I am doing this. I am already preparing for what is about to happen after Mm -hmm. I finish this, right? There is a preparation for the next that we have. And I think that sometimes we're missing the mark by um, um, not, it's kind of like what we were talking about with this pivoting, right? Not making a conscious decision that I'm just going to stay right here, right? And I'm going to do it the way that it always has been done Mm -hmm. with the people who have always done it. And as a result, we end up missing when it's time to go to the other side. Because when Jesus makes this declaration to them that it's time to go over to the other side, can you imagine if some of them weren't in the boat, but they were standing on the shore, right? Like it would have been too late by them because Jesus was ready. And as you talked about, when Jesus was ready, he left, Mm -hmm. right? Like he, like there was a time when they were looking for Jesus and he had disappeared through the crowd. Like when Jesus is gone, he is gone. And I think that it is, it is a message to us about the timing of God, the importance of being in alignment with God mm-hmm. and the timing of God and not missing it when he is ready to go to the other side. Yeah. My prayer right now is Lord help me. Um, <laughs> help us because all. the amount of times on a Sunday morning when I have seen you and you disappeared, like, <laughs> I'm literally li- <laughs> literally um but i i so i'm just like okay step up your game ma'am um but also in this moment we see his ability to multitask and i think that we have moments where we don't know we don't practice we don't exercise the idea of excelling in the now while preparing for the next yes we try to do one and then the other but um i think this moment shows this this ability to you can do both at the same time and not neglect the crowd that you're called to not neglect the the point or the assignment that you are in um so i i just and it's crazy because that definitely means that he was in tune. Um, well, it shows that we can be in tune with um, not just what is happening now, but what is to come. And the same thing for his disciples, as we were talking about, um, that level of submission and connection to your leader. Like, okay, you may be struggling a little bit, but at least get the boat ready. I know you can get the boat ready. You've done it before. Like, this, is, this isn't this is even anything new. Um, and I, I still think that actually volumes to Christ as a leader. It's just like he knew where they were. They knew he knew that they were shaky and was still able to do what he needed to do and still teach them with where they were at. Like work on 
what you actually are fantastic at and watch me in the midst of all of that and watch those two worlds come together and you grow as a result of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was like a perfect segue. Um, because I think what I am realizing now, um, being the new director of Christian education, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> when, you, when you're in something that you're really passionate about, um, I think you can find it easier to do the now and the next thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, because it's it, like, you're, you don't have to work too hard to get your brain there, it's already there. Mm -hmm. um, when, when, you are, when you are in the vein of God and doing something that he's really called you to do, mm -hmm. um, working in this space and in the next space, it comes very naturally. Um, and so what I would say is, if, you f if it's so overwhelming, and, and of course, like, there's always something that can be done, right, for mm -hmm. the kingdom. Um, but what I've seen is that people who have their hands in too many things often um, find it hard to do the now and the next. Like, it's, it's a lot of now um, and being overwhelmed. Um, but once you lock into, like, purpose and once you lock into just stop reaching for things that you think will get you a crowd um, mm. and do what you are called to do, and that may just be one thing yeah. um, and not 20 different things. That's okay. And, that, and that's okay, <laughs> right? But once you lock into that and fully devote to that and give excellence and everything that God gave you to pour back into it, mm -hmm. um, the now and the next, it flows a little bit more easily and you'll see the need of the people being met. Mm -hmm. And once you see that, once you see those, oh, like, wow, she got that or he got that or this is what I was able to contribute to. It gets it's it fuels you to be able to give them more because they're so hungry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say purpose um, will pull you into being able to flow in the now and the next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Verse 37 says, and a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. Right. This is a natural disaster, right? Wind, wind storms actually um, were very common. Like this wasn't something that was uncommon. This, this was very common in the Sea um, of Galilee where they were. Um, and they were frequent, but they were, they were known to be dangerous to, um, to small boats. And now consider this, that um, many of the disciples were fishermen by trade, right? So they knew this. This wasn't something that was foreign to them. They knew this, yet they went yeah. anyhow. Yet they went Mm -hmm. Anyhow, and I want to say this. I want to say this because um, I think sometimes when we receive the word of the Lord, when we receive the instructions from the Lord, um, we also um, imagine an outcome. Mm -hmm. um, we have set in our minds how this is going to play out. And mm -hmm. it is always beautiful. <laughs> it, is, always. it is always wonderful. It is always um, full of good and without any type of real, you know, friction. Um, but that is not what was promised, right? Um, in the instance of these disciples, it is Jesus who tells them to get on this boat. It is Jesus who sends them into the Sea of Galilee. It is Jesus who knows all things. And so Jesus intentionally sends them into a storm. He intentionally sends them into a storm and they go with Jesus knowing that this danger might await them. And I think that the message um, for us, right, is to trust him anyhow, mm -hmm. right? I, yeah. think, I think that um, we trust him as long as we believe. We have this like preoccupation with safety. I think that mm -hmm. we, we trust him as long as we believe it's going to be safe. So we, we trust him as long as we believe it's going to work the way we want it to work. Mm -hmm. um, it will work for good, but good doesn't always look as good yeah. to you as it is to him, right? Yeah. It is for your good, but it might not look so good when it's all said and done. And so I think that um, as, as we really begin to process what God wants us to do, I think part of that is divorcing ourselves from what we think the outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Y'all all right? <laughs> no, no, never all right. Um, th that thing that you said about safety is yeah. just so good. So good. Um, I think we, we really have to trust, and this is from somebody who's in it, child. Uh, we really have to trust that God really knows the end from the beginning mm -hmm. and there is nothing that he is putting us into um, that will, I'm not gonna say not, not hurt us, cause that's not true. 
because some things do come to hurt us, but they make us better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what we are, we are enthralled with. We, are, we have a romantic relationship with God in that we think that, it, oh, you'll never hurt me, right? But there are some <laughs> things that he hurt, like some his own hurt. son was bruised for yeah. our, like, so we, there yeah. is some hurt that comes in any type of relationship. Um, but I think about the scripture. Oh when, God, wait, when, don't rush. Sorry. Say, say that, that last part one more time. That was so good. You said there's some hurt that, that comes, comes with any relationship. Any relationship. And any relationship. can I, I know, ahead, and don't lose your point, I'm but I, I felt like, I felt strongly that that needed to be emphasized mm -hmm. because I think we throw away relationships really quickly. We throw them away because there was some hurt involved in it. It's the moment that somebody hurts us, we're out. The moment that somebody doesn't do what we think they should have done, we're out. The moment that somebody, you know, um, comes yeah. against us, I don't even know what that fully means. We're out, but there are but relationships are the long haul. They're not the short yeah, term, right? Yeah. And so there are some things that will happen in the context of relationship, and it does not mean that the relationship is not good. It means that yeah. we've got to work through it. Yeah, yeah. that yeah. was really really. And good. even with Jesus, there's some things you're gonna have even, to work through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even with Jesus. Mm -hmm. yes. um, but I think, and even with that, the beauty in that is that He's not scared that we are mad at Him, or that we feel like He He's not afraid of that this really hurt me. He's not afraid of that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but what I was going to say is I think about the scripture um, where Jesus says, be perfect as I am perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and that word perfect translating to mature. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some things that God wants to mature in us mm -hmm. that will take us against the grain, that will take us the long way, that yeah. will take us Preach. the hard way. Um, but the maturity that comes out of it is one that you don't get on an easy road. Oh, you man. don't get maturity with roses and lilies and harps playing in the background. <laughs> you get maturity often by hardship. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that doesn't mean that everything's going to be terrible, right? But we have to be realists. As real as we understand that if you're in a romantic relationship, somebody's going to do you wrong, I hope we understand that. We have to be that real in any, like you said, in any other relationship, but even in our relationship with God. There has to be an understanding that the rain falls on the just. Yeah. As well as the yeah and mm -hmm. we have to trust the intention yes right because i want to clear that up as yeah. well right like hurt comes in any relationship mm -hmm. um but it's the intention did you intend yeah, to yeah, hurt yeah. me mm -hmm. now intentional hurt we might have to part ways on right. that intentional hurt right mm -hmm. and so i want to be clear on that right jesus is not ever setting out to intentionally hurt her, us, but he knows, hey, if I allow you to experience this, there is a greater good that is here. My intention is always for good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. I think the biggest thing for me, and y'all said everything I had to say, so um, my, my two cents is um, <laughs> that we've been speaking a lot about endurance and endurance and trust have a positive correlation. Mm -hmm. So if you are not trusting in the process, if you are not trusting in Christ, you cannot endure, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that what made, what helped the disciples be successful and not just go through the motions with Jesus, but to thrive is because they trusted him as their leader. They yeah. trusted mm. him as their teacher and that produced the endurance um and i think a lot of times we try to separate the two and it really makes me wonder whether or not they they had like some dialogue with one another prior to like you know um he did ask us to prep the boat <laughs> but we're like at the sea of galilee right and i don't know if you remember but i remember how this worked. right you know like right. i really wonder if they were sitting in the boat like this Confused, yeah. Um, or if like there was just this sincere rest in mm. he said it. Yeah. So why not? Yeah. Because they, they they left space for for those intentions, you know? And I'm sure he also left space for those questions because yeah. he, he knew where, where they were at. And I think any good leader will, you know, oh. especially if you're in those early spaces, spaces you'll leave the space for, for those, those questions. questions. Um but as, as a recipient someone who's following you'll also leave space for i'm i am learning more about you yeah. and mm -hmm. i'm learning more about myself mm -hmm. um and committing to, to that, that learning process and understanding that there you in that learning process you actually may learn some, some with the hurting i think, I think there's, there's some hurt that's, that's actually good, good. 
in a weird way mm -hmm. in the sense that it will expose that part of you that wasn't necessary yeah um oh god you know, and i i think that that is the part that we are most fearful of in trusting someone else if i trust you will you actually hurt me so much by exposing the part of me that is not necessary that's a sailor moment right there. I just want to lay right down on this carpet. I'm still laying down. You guys said <laughs> no, that, that is too good. All right. Well, we're out here now. <laughs> right? right? <laughs> now, and that's not just me saying that. Like, I normally say that. That's actually our next point. Right? We, we <laughs> are out here now. Right? We're out here now. With, 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 the, um, with all of that that's happening, we just talked about the impact of, of the winds and the waves on the boat. It is now too late for them to turn around. And for somebody, I, well, I feel like I'm about to shift. For somebody, that's actually good news. That's good news. That's actually good news. Like, I am too far from the shore to turn around now. And, um, like, I, there's nothing left but to trust him, right? Like, I'm all in, right, at this point. Um, the waves are coming. The winds are coming. The storm is 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 blowing but i'm out here now right and we have no other choice but to trust them they were left to the elements but they were left to the elements with jesus right but they were also left to the elements in this boat right that was now <laughs> filling up with water the bible says the boat is filling up with water it is about to sink and the question really is how how do you respond when the thing that is used to carry you is just as broken as you are. How do you respond when the thing that is used to carry you is just as broken as you are? This boat that is supposed to be able to support them is about to go under. And if we are honest, we have been in this situation ourselves when the thing that we thought was going to be able to support us, the person that we thought was going to support us, the system that we thought was going to support us, we found out it was just as broken as we were. Mm -hmm. And we had to figure out that our faith couldn't be in that. Mm -hmm. The faith is not in the boat. The faith is not in my spouse. The faith is not in it's, it's not in these temporal things. But my faith has got to be rooted in Jesus and Jesus alone. I want to um, read the scripture and then I'm going to throw it back. Um, first John, the second chapter, 15 through 17, says this. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possessions is not from the father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Right. And so under these circumstances, there was only one thing left to do. It was to forsake everything else, forsake their their um, preconceived notions, forsake their ideas of what it would look like, forsake forsake all of that and just cleave and cling to what it is that Jesus was saying. Yeah. So I had a, a funny, not so funny visual in my head of like the disciples when the boat was starting to break. Um, them trying to catch the pieces and like put them back together They're like oh no come on we got to put the boat back together in the middle of the storm when Jesus is right there and I think um, going along with this scripture we still we see our quote-unquote boat is breaking it's dismantling it's just it's destroying and it can't actually um, sustain what we are enduring but we still invest our time and our energy in trying to fix the thing that we want to carry us mm -hmm. as if Christ is True. not available. Yeah. Um, so I, I really, I, I just wanted to kind of put that visual out there because um, you could actually be putting yourself in more danger mm -hmm. rather than saying like, yes, Christ is with me. I am, I, I am too far out here, but thank you, Lord, that you are with me and focusing on him rather than focusing on trying to fix the mess or fix the thing that you're so used to supporting you. Yeah, this makes me think about, um, similar to what you just said about them possibly trying to like reconstruct the boat, um, like what my first instinct is when trouble comes. Mm. Like, is my first instinct to repair the situation? Is my first instinct to... Hold on to the closest person next to me. Like, what or is my first instinct to go, hold on, 
who's in the boat with me? Yeah. Right? Like the, the one that's in the boat with me. Um, and oftentimes that first instinct reveals what's in my heart um, and what I've been cleaving to the most before this moment. Um, because it's not that it just popped into my mind to trust the boat. My faith was in the boat as soon as I stepped into it. Yeah. Uh, my, my faith was always misplaced. Um, so in these storms, in these situations, we see what we've been trusting. We see where we've, what we've put on the throne of our hearts. We see, um, and we may think some of them are really good reasons. Like, what do you mean this is my spouse? Of course I trust them. That's okay, but right. who do you trust more? Right. Um, and, and what will you do if that ever goes out, right? Like, what, what, what's, what's next um, in, in, the, in the things that you're reaching for? Because the first thing that we should be reaching for um, is the peace of Christ. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, verse 38 says this. It says, but he was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Unbothered. <laughs> Jesus is absolutely unbothered. Water is filling the boat. The winds and the waves are rocking the joint. They are probably hollering and screaming. Jesus is downstairs yes. <laughs> in the rear. Because <laughs> it's a yacht now. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is on the boat and he is sleeping. Actually, the, the Bible says that it's the stern of the boat, right? So the stern of the boat is actually the rear, right? So Jesus is at the back of the boat, right? Like he's not under. He's at the back of the boat. The of the boat. Water is coming in right where he's at, but he's sleeping. Right. And the disciples response to him. Right. The, the disciples response was an effort um, for them to change Jesus's posture. The problem is they wanted to change Jesus's posture rather than Jesus changing their posture. Yeah. And often that's what our prayer life looks like. Mm -hmm. Our prayer life My is Lord. us trying to change Jesus's stance. Change what you said about this. Change the circumstance that you sent me into. Change the circumstance that you designed for me to learn from, for me to grow from. Change it. And we are begging and we are pleading and he is asleep. And the reason why he is asleep is because there is a greater purpose to this circumstance than your comfort. There is something that is greater at stake than your comfort. Right. And so he wants to change our position, no matter what is happening, our posture, no matter what is happening, no matter what storms are coming, he wants you to, to be unbothered. Matthew, the 11th chapter, verse 28 and 30 uh, through 30 says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is is light right now i want to remind you at this point they have seen jesus do yeah. they have seen him work miracles mm -hmm. they have seen him work countless miracles they have already understood who he is right they they, they get it they understand yeah. where he came from they have been walking with him they have been talking with him they have been working with him they have been taught by Jesus. And now that they are the ones who are in need of the miracle, mm -hmm. now all faith gets lost because it, they have now shifted from assisting Jesus to actually needing assistance from Jesus. Ooh. And I think that um, for many of us, particularly those of us wow. who are um, in ministry, I think that meaning working um, directly in ministry, I think that we can get to the point where we can believe God for everybody else yeah. and we can help you Man. get out of your circumstance. I'm preaching. I'm preaching. You can you can we can help everybody else out of their circumstance. But the moment that we are hit with a circumstance, suddenly that faith that we had for everybody else, it can seem so far away from our, for ourselves. And so I think that we've got to get to the point where um, where we believe him consistently, yeah. that there's a consistency in our belief and that it's not um, fleeting. That it's not fleeting. Yeah. And I think this comes to, because for, for me, um, all of that crossed my mind, but also um, how you've basically been telling us it's like laborers grow up, like you're not the harvest, right? <laughs> and I think that this could have also been a moment for them where there was a shift of, 
clearly, is there a difference in the way that you treat the harvest versus you treat versus how you treat us as disciples? Um, like, are we an exception? And I think for us as believers, we have to understand that He's Lord of the fa uh, Lord of the harvest, but He's He's a Father to us. Yeah. So it's not like He has forsaken you. Um, the, Never. The, there's, there's, there's even, you could argue, some sort of special treatment. Mm -hmm. And that's why he can rest in that. And that's why um, he can encourage you to also rest in that and, and learn from the son, learn from Jesus, instead of freaking out. Because there should be an, almost an extra level of rest that we yeah. have not only experienced you as Lord of the Harvest, we now experience you as a father. Yeah. We now know you, and we now come to you as sons. So this is it's, it all all is well. Like, oh, you sleep. Hold on, move over. Let me get a pillow too. You know, like in, instead of um, going into panic mode. And I, once again, I think it's great that they can ask questions. Um, but as sons, there there are times when a question isn't necessarily needed. Observation. And applications was required. There, there's something, and I, th I think that I, I want to just elaborate on what you just said, um, because I think, I think what's locked in there is the reality that we accept aspects of our relationship with God, mm -hmm. right? And so. Perhaps we do know him as Lord, but we don't know him as father. Right. Or we accepted him as father, um, but we really don't understand the idea of savior. Right. Like there, there are so he is multifaceted and what he has done for us um, is it's innumerable. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, it's in the development of our relationship with him yeah. that I think we've got to be careful not to limit him to one specific role, yeah. right? That this is all that you are to me, all you are, right? And there's some people who are extra friendly with Jesus, right? Like, I am a friend of God and you rock it and you happy, but you forgot, right? That he's, that there's more to this relationship than yeah. just his friendship, right? Yeah. Um, and in doing so, you might be dishonoring a part of him that you're gonna need later on. And so I, I think that we have to focus on the underdeveloped aspects of our relationship with, yeah. with him. That's really good. And just thinking about what you said, um, Pastor Adrian, about the fact that there is like a special privilege that we get. Um, the crowd didn't get to go into the boat. Right. So like the, the crowd didn't get boat Jesus. Yeah, yeah. They, like the disciples got to see a different part of him. Like you said, they had a different type of ac um, access to him. And so like you said about us having that father relationship and that special privilege that others don't have, we should really take advantage of that. And the fact that um, like Jesus didn't just sleep around anybody. Right, like he wasn't just in the crowd, like knocked out. Yeah, sleep. yeah. So there yeah. was some type of assurance that he had in this moment yeah, yeah. that nobody else ever got to see. Yeah. Um, and so, and the fact that he was on that pillow means he was extra comfortable. Yo. Okay, like went and grabbed it. Like, was did, did anybody pack a pillow? Anyways, put the pillow on the boat. That's what I want to know. Um, but the fact that he was that comfortable. He was showing another side to himself. Mm -hmm. And I think in our storm, I put it in quotes, our storm like situations, um, we have to see what different side, what under what other undeveloped side of you are you showing me today, Jesus? Yeah. What can I see from you that I've never seen from you before? How can I trust you in a way I've never trusted you before? Because I've never seen you like this before. I've never needed you like this before. Um, and so there's a reason why Jesus is behaving the way he's behaving in your storm. Yeah. Like there's a reason why he's showing you what he's showing. And it's not because he doesn't care. I'm queen of don't you care. That is like, I should get a t-shirt. You definitely are. You are. You are. So as a person who probably could have wrote that scripture, what I will say is in those situations, God is not, is not trying to show me he doesn't care. He's trying to show me that. He cares all the more. It's just a different yeah, way. Yeah. And you need to feel a different way. Caring is not, oh, I, I love you so much. And hug me and come sit on my lap and come sit next to me. That's not always what care right. is. There are yeah. different types of care. Absolutely. What you need to see now is the, the stern father who won't give you what you always feel you need, but what you really need in the situation. So good. Um, and so we need to just see what is Jesus trying to teach me that I've never seen before um, in this situation. Yeah. Can I just go back? Yeah, yeah. That's fine. But... Um, mentioning going back, back to the whole crossover concept like none of that would have happened if they didn't actually commit to crossing over with him they would yeah. have never seen 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure, crowd experience. Yeah. Like when, when there's more, so I just, it just kind of confirms the the importance of going and, and doing that next, so mm-hmm. that you can experience that other side. Yeah. 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 Something I didn't intend to talk about, um, but I want to talk about now is is how how the our line of questioning um, is indicative of our heart's posture. Mm-hmm. Right, like when this this whole thing starts to happen, right? They don't say, yeah. "Hey, Jesus, we're we're afraid." Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, like there's a there's mm-hmm. a humility that comes along with yeah, saying, yeah, yeah. "Hey, I'm scared." Yeah, yeah. But I know who you are. Yeah. I don't know what this is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can you help me? Mm-hmm. Right, help us. Right, or speak mm-hmm. to it. Right. There's that. Yeah. These jokers said, yeah. "Hey." Yeah. <laughs> Don't you care that we about to die? Right? Like, yeah. do like it it really spoke to their understanding of him. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. if they really fully understood who Jesus was, and we know that Jesus had an ongoing questioning of whether or not they really understood yes. who he was. Um, that wasn't a one-time thing. That he consistently yeah. kind of challenged them, well, who do you really think that I am? Yeah. Um but I think that it was because of this, right? Because Jesus understood that they didn't fully mm-hmm. grasp. And I think that um, that's that thing that we, and we quote it, but I don't think we really get it, that we go from faith to faith yes. and from glory to glory. And so it wasn't that the disciples didn't believe because if they didn't believe, they wouldn't have gone on the boat. Yeah. They believed, but w- the next season of their life required a greater level of faith. Yeah. And so I think that... Um, I want to challenge us to see that some of the things that we are asking for, while you're asking for it, also ask for greater faith. Mm -hmm. Because if he gives it to you, it's going to require more of you than what you have been exposed to on this level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus steps in in verse 39. Now he's and the Bible says, and he awoke (laughs) and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And um, yeah, many, many people focus on on what Jesus said um, in the scripture. But in um, the other gospels, in in Matthew, the eighth chapter, in Luke, the eighth chapter, they do not even mention what was said at all. Right. And even when Mark is depicting this whole picture, there are very few words from Jesus that and, and, and what it really does reveal yeah, yeah, to yeah. us is that it didn't take a lot of work. It didn't take a lot of fancy words mm-hmm. like Jesus just stood up in his authority and he spoke. Right. And um, it, it really begins to one remind us of who we serve. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. That the winds and the seas obey him. We're going to talk about the disciples response in a minute. Right. But this is the God that we serve. Right. That that everything is um, obedient to his voice, right? Everything is obedient to his voice. But I want to talk about the flip side of that. The flip side of that is that because we are joint heirs with Christ, because of that fact, there is also an authority that we have been given. There is also an expectation that he has of us in order to be able to speak to a thing and cause it to cease as well, right? Um, Matthew 28 um, and 18 says this. It says, and Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And here's the thing. He then transfers that authority to us. The problem is we don't believe that latter part. We get the part that all authority is his. But we miss that we are agents, that we are ambassadors of his on this earth. And so while we are here, we get to be we get to look at storms and speak to it. We also get to look at storms and sleep through it. We get to do both, right? And so, so, and so our job is to allow the Holy Spirit to teach us, what am I going to do in this storm? Is this a storm that I need to speak to or is this a storm that I need to sleep through? I'm not doing it. <laughs> Sleep for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my Lord. I had one point. <laughs> one little point because that just wrecked my whole life. Um, but when Jesus does speak, to, well, in this this um, account of what he said, um, it really stuck out to me that he said, peace be still. Um, because it seems that you can have peace, but not be still. 
Mm-hmm. Or you can be still and not have peace. That's really um, interesting. The fact that he said both indicates that there was something that still needs to be done. So if there was peace, but no stillness, the disciples still could have been thrown off. Mm-hmm. Or if there was stillness, but no peace, there would still be something going on inside mm-hmm. of them. Um, and so I think having peace and stillness um, is really mm-hmm. an indicator of how you've managed the storm. Mm. Um, because we, all, we obviously know peace is not the absence of chaos, right? It's, it's our ability to be stable in that thing. Um, but when Jesus speaks peace and stillness to us, that's a complete thing. Mm-hmm. Like that covers all bases. Um, and being able to speak that to a storm and not everything else that we'd be saying, right? When we'd be speaking to stuff, we get all riled up, right? Um, but if you can have peace and stillness in the storm, that can produce sleep. And that, and that can, can produce rest, rest. And, and that, that can produce, produce um, a trust in God that can be moved. Yeah. yeah. That's so good. That's really, really good. I just, um, for, for me, one, you still mess me up. So <laughs> I'm, I'm having a moment. Um, but I, I do think that it, it is so important for us to understand that authority that he's given us. And that's, that, that scripture said heaven and earth. Heaven like, and earth. That's. That's, That's some vast authority <laughs> yeah. that he has that was yeah. given to him. Like mm-hmm. the amount of humility in him just saying, yes. like, I am the Christ, but this was given to me. Like, yeah. that's, that's, but that's a whole other conversation. But then still take it to the next level and give that to us and how um, we can mishandle that or we can, I, I think our, our, it really comes down to Sorry. ignorance and <laughs> <laughs> ignorance and confidence in 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 um understanding what it is that we have yeah um, and knowing how to use it knowing how to use it and when to use it because i think we do have a tendency of sleeping when we should be speaking and speaking when we should be sleeping um but that deals with our understanding of how to use our authority but i really just i just love the fact that one, he woke up. Yeah, yeah. He woke up. Yeah. I can, can I just, I'm going to rat out my family. When I was younger, I would have nightmares, and there would be two different experiences depending on who I was dealing with. So I would wake up, and I would run, and I'd be like, oh, my gosh, I just had a nightmare. Save me. And there would be some family members that would turn over and say a few things that are not very nice. And then there are others that would be like, come on, get in the bed with me. Like, everything's okay. Um, and the fact that he did wake up and he responded to the mess, and then we see that he still gave them a response, I just think it just speaks volumes to how you were talking about like that different level of care that shows that he cares because there's so many of us like in prayer people have been snapping and say wake up we wake you up in the spirit and you roll over you roll over in your authority you choose to roll over rather than to respond in with words and um with with the other authority that you do have so i do i do think it just speaks to his maturity um and the love that he he has for us can I say something else? Yes, because I'm weak. I'm, t- I'm weak over here. <laughs> yeah, like, what is happening? <laughs> I, you know what? I'm never going to say again. I'm not saying I'm taking anything back from the devil. I've been said that. You should have. He don't have it. Like, if all authority was given to Jesus and he gave it to me, there's nothing that the devil. Uh uh-uh. uh. Sorry. <laughs> I was sitting here and I thought about that. Like, we have given so much permission and footway and everything to the enemy. We've given so many things and given him power that he's taken things from us when we've been giving Giving it, say it. Um, We've we've, we've been giving it to him and we've been giving him our authority. And Mm -hmm. so that's why he has that place. But if we take our rightful place back in that place of authority, there's nothing that he can take from us because we have authority to to hold it. Stop giving it. Not taking it it back, not taking it back from (laughs) him, but not even giving it. Like we don't, we have the authority to hold on to it um, and claim it as the as the sons of God. I just got, yeah, I just got that. Is that when you like? That's yeah. That's when I clicked my foot because I got it. I'm like really got to get myself together over here. All right, let's wrap this up. So, verse forty, he said to them, "Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith?" 
And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Right. Um, this is I got so much to say, I think. Right. So I'm going to try to condense all of this. I, I felt like brain overload. Right. But is this this is this is the um, the issue that I feel like we see um, presently, um, even within um, the believers. Yeah. Right. It's going to either be faith in him yeah. or fascination for him. Right. It can't be both. Right. Because a lot of us are claiming faith, but it's really I'm fascinated by what you do. Like I'm wowed by what I see, but I don't necessarily have a full belief and a full connection to what it is that you have done and what it is that you are actually capable of doing. You cannot have it both ways. Either we are going to believe and stand on the truth of that, yeah. or we're going to watch in awe of what he does for somebody else, right? But mm -hmm. it, you can't have it both ways, right? And so um, they, they, they asked him, right? Here's why I'm saying this. They asked him to stop the storm, mm. but they were shocked when the storm stopped, <laughs> right? Like, I want to say it again. They asked him, to stop the storm. They even accused them of possibly not caring. And then when the storm stops, they're shocked by what it is that has happened, right? This speaks to what they thought about Jesus. This speaks to the truth that of what was actually happening in their heart. That while they were, um, to be honest, I actually don't even think that they really made a real petition. I don't see this as a real petition. They were panicking. Yes. And there was a difference between our panic and our petition. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us are calling panic prayer. Mm -hmm. Th that's not prayer, right? That is, that is us just going, you know, doing what we do, right? Going crazy, um, murmuring, complaining even. Um, but that is not prayer, right? There is a confidence, right? The Bible talks about us um, approaching the throne of grace, right? Boldly, right? Um, with confidence um, and, and because of who he is, right? So we don't do that because of our own nature. We don't do that because of our own power, or our own strength, but because I know who he is, right? And I know who I am um, in him, right? And because of that, I approach him differently. I approach him understanding that he is more than able to do it. And if I am in um, in some form of danger, I believe that my God is going to protect me in what it is that I am experiencing. Right. And so I want to challenge us um, to not be like the disciples. Right. To not um, ask things of him that we're not also simultaneously expecting, that we are not um, asking amiss. Right. That we're not praying amiss. Right. Thinking um, one thing and praying another thing, right? Um, in our hearts, harboring one thing, but in actuality, carrying, you know, um, not expecting him to actually carry out the truth of what he has said in his word. And so, um, James 1, I want to read this and then I'm going to toss it back out. James 1 and 6 says this, but let him ask in faith with no, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. The one who, who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And so I, I want to say this, maybe um, maybe the miracle that you need is for Jesus to speak peace to the waves of doubt caused by the winds of life in you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That, that sometimes we're so busy trying to speak to the circumstance that we forgot to speak to ourselves, mm -hmm. that that before you calm those storms, before you calm these waters, Calm the what is the chaos in me first. Right. Because if you calm it in me first, I learn something through this process that will carry me into the next storm. So yes. when the next storm comes, my response won't be the same anymore because I I'm anchored in you now. Right. Like I have yeah. I have a history with you. I know yeah. that you have calmed me in the midst of a storm before. And so the next time the storm presents itself, I won't be as easily swayed by the storm as I was before. Right. And so the miracle, um, even as we were kind of talking about this whole idea of miracles, the miracle actually might not be external at all. Right. Mm -hmm. It might not actually be a physical healing at all. Right. The miracle actually might be an internal healing. Right. The thing that I need is not anything that is visible. It is not something that is tangible. There are some things in me that I know that God, this needs to be quieted in me. Yeah. This, I need a stillness in me. I need a peace in me. 
and I know that you're capable of doing it. And when you do it, I can declare that that's a miracle because I recognize yeah. that everything was stacked up against me being able to ever calm the storm that was inside of me, right? Mm -hmm. And God is able to speak right into that space yeah. and to calm it. And let me just add this. He's able to do that instantly. And so for yeah. some of us, we want to go through this long process. And, and that's cool. Sometimes he will take you through a process. Mm -hmm. But I also want you to believe him for instant change. I want you to believe him for instant peace. I want you to believe him for instant joy. I want you to believe him um, for instant um, um, stability, right? Like these are things that God can do instantly. And we, I, I'm afraid that we've been settling um, for, for this long drawn out process that he may not actually be asking you to go through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, my, my biggest thing from that, because you, you mentioned uh, how you can learn from all of this. And I think that some of us can actually be missing out on our miracle because it's not the miracle we want. Yes. So we don't want to learn. So I'll opt out on the miracle. Yeah. I don't want to grow. So I'll opt out on the miracle. Just fix this. Yeah. Fix them. Don't build me. Yeah. Um, and if we only realize that God cares more about you being developed mm -hmm. than that storm shutting down. Like he, like he was fine with the storm. He, he asked them about their fear. Yeah. Um, so I, I really think that just speaks to one, how he, he really could have went back to sleep for one, but, and maybe he did after this, but the fact that he still took the time to ask those questions, to really have them thinking about where does your confidence lie in me? Yeah. And where does your confidence lie in who you are or who you're becoming? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was, from what you have shared, it really seems like it came down to a confidence issue um, that held them back. But I, the, the main thing that I, I, I've gathered from this is that um, some, so you, last week you had mentioned the whole, the whole idea of um, us, you know, miracle not necessarily be for you. It could be for somebody else. What if you got both? You, you can mm -hmm. think about a miracle for someone else, but the miracle for you is really just one that you don't want to deal with. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to deal with the results yeah. of the miracle. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't know who you will be after the miracle is done. Yeah. Before, Janae, before you go, I want to just point, highlight um, just one question that continues to jump out, out, out at me in verse 40. Um, he, says, he says, why are you so afraid? But then he says, have you still no, no. faith? Still. It's that still that jumps out for me, yeah. right? Um, because it indicates that he, what he's really um, implying is that by now something should have changed, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, I, and I, I feel like, I wanted to go back to that because I feel like the Lord is really impressing that um, even on us, even on some of you who are at home, that there is a graduation that's necessary, mm -hmm. right? That I think that you know, um, the Bible talks about how he gives us the measure of faith. He gives that. Um, but then after that, he expects that there is something that is developed through our connection, through our relationship, through our time. Right. The reason why he's saying, have you still no faith is because you've experienced me. You've walked with me. I've shown you things. I've revealed some things with you. We've, we've done this for a minute and you still don't have faith. And so I want you to really, I want to just, um, right before you go, I want to just encourage people to check his resume, right? Because his resume speaks for itself and his resume is designed to develop the faith in you, to stir up something yeah. in you um, that perhaps you might have forgotten. So check his resume. It's good. And actually, um, that's really good to piggyback off of because what I was thinking when you said about faith or fascination, um, fascination doesn't grow. Right. Right. Like when you're fascinated it just is with what something, it is. Yeah. that's it. Yeah. Oh my goodness, I'm fascinated. Like there is no development to fascination. There is there is nothing long lasting about being fascinated until the next thing to be fascinated about. Yeah. Right? But faith does grow. And here is where you see the development of the Christian. If you haven't been, if your faith hasn't been growing, I would tend to say that it is fascination. Yeah. Um, because if there is some, like you said, if you are moving past the measure of faith and we're going from faith to faith to glory to glory, mm -hmm. 
you get past that fascination stage, there is something bigger that comes of it. There is, there is more expectation that comes from it. Fascination will leave you in the same place because you are still just in awe and in wonder. Yeah. But faith is rooted. It's deep. It's something that um, it grows more and more over time. And so um, what I would say is, and I think we all, especially in the beginning of our relationship with God, we really are fascinated with him. Like we're enamored. Like, yeah. oh my goodness, you can do this? This is amazing. Um, but there does come a time when faith, fascination switches over to faith or it's completely el eliminated and we get this real faith, this real faith, mm -hmm. this real Jesus um, that grounds us and allows us to trust his this idea of him being all powered and not just being impressed by it mm -hmm. um, because we can be like floored by what he does and his abilities um, but that doesn't keep us mm -hmm. yeah being fascinated doesn't keep us um, faith is what keeps us and it trusts us and allows us to trust him when the next thing really requires our faith um, and none of our fascination yeah that's good um i, I want to point out before we close i want to point out um that the need for the miracle was spawned by jesus that mm -hmm. the situation itself that was created that mm -hmm. necessitated a miracle yeah. was actually created by Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. And so I want us to really begin to consider the things that we might be experiencing mm -hmm. and really take another look, because sometimes I think that we're mislabeling things, that there are some things that are sent by God. This is yeah. not the enemy. This is not your friends and your family members. This is God. And God will send us some situations to challenge us, to make us depend on him, to make us lean on him and to develop that thing in us um, that is weakened right now. Right. And so um, there are some things that I believe that is ha that are happening to you right now yeah. that God is using to mm -hmm. challenge you to go from where you are right now to the place where he is right now um, because he has crossed over to the other side. And now it's your turn to cross over with. Him. So I pray that you all receive something tonight. Um, again, you still have time. Share it with somebody. Um, and um, let's build off of this week to week. So get ready for next week. We love you and we'll see you next Thursday.